afternoon we're going to be looking at a subject that uh, I've written a book on called The Time of Departing, uh, Contemplative Prayer. I want to start off by saying one of the things that uh, got me interested in this subject was Bible prophecy. That uh, I'd grown up in a household, a family that uh, had emphasized uh, eschatology, you know, Bible prophecy. And when I started to see certain things take place, you know, certain things unfold, I, you know, it kind of clicked. There was, there was a uh, recognition that, you know, what the scriptures had foretold was starting to uh, come to pass. Of course, uh, most of you remember a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, Earth right? It was popular in the 1970s, and it uh, said that uh, basically that uh, the rebirth of Israel it was a sign that we were entering the uh, approach of uh, what the book of Revelation talks about, you know, the end times, the last days, so to speak. And a lot of people got interested in Christianity through reading that book. But now, you know, people are very, very, uh, you know, they want their end times, they want it right now, you know. <laughs> they don't want to <laughs> wait around a few decades. So, you know, it went through the 80s and 90s, and various people were predicting things. I think there, a few years ago, there was a, I can't remember his name, but a guy had billboards all over the place saying, you know, the end of the world is October or something. Or How many of you remember that? Or remember hearing about that? Well, you know, the, these dates come and go, and there's no end of the world, and so uh, people get disillusioned, they get uh, demoralized, and they go on to other things, they, you know, just live their lives. But the thing is, while all this is, you know, all this hubbub is going on, there is a uh, unfolding of Bible prophecy, and it may be subtle, but it's there. And we looked at, just a few hours ago, we looked at the rise of occultism and Eastern mysticism in uh, the Western world and how it's impacting people, you know, mindfulness, Reiki, yoga, things of that nature. But there's also a mystical revolution going on within Christianity, or Christendom, I should say. And that's what we're going to look at right now. Again, Alice Bailey uh, foretold this. This is not something that just popped into uh, being out of the blue. Alice Bailey, the famous uh, occult prophetess, actually uh, wrote uh, or channeled books about this some decades back. And in her, well, this wasn't. This is one of the few books she didn't channel. It was her autobiography, and she said, or Bailey was under the firm conviction that the teaching from the East and of the West must be fused and blended before the true and universal religion for which the world waits could appear on earth. And this was the theme of Alice Bailey's um, books that she channeled, that there was this coming new vital world religion that would unite the entire, you know, it would be a world religion. It wouldn't be just like found in this country or that country, you know, like now, or traditionally, like you had Catholicism in places like uh, Ireland and Spain and Poland, and then you had uh, Islam in places like, you know, Morocco and Algeria, and, you know, things like that. But this would be a universal world religion. And she said that this was going to be where the teaching from the East into the West would be fused and blended. Now, this is totally apart from what you saw earlier that. Uh, you know, these various mystical traditions were being promoted in a secular uh, viewpoint, or a secular uh, arena. This is something that would happen in the religious arena. Not secular, but religious. And I started to see that this was going on. It didn't take me long to realize that there was a New Age component within the Christian churches. She wrote, the Christian Church in its many branches could serve as a St. John the Baptist, as a voice crying in the wilderness, and as a nucleus through which world illumination may be accomplished. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but actually she said that Christianity in its many branches 
would actually be, instead of impeding the new age, instead of stopping the age of Aquarius, would actually be a vehicle or a nucleus of promoting the new age. This is from my book, but this, this uh, is a term that she used. Alice Bailey's, Alice Bailey prophecies can provide further insight into what the Apostle Paul called a falling away. Bailey eagerly foretold of what she termed the regeneration of the churches. And by regeneration, she meant the abandoning of traditional Christianity and the implementation of a more mystical, occultic form of Christianity, which was, in essence, not Christianity at all. And she said that there would be an individual known as the coming one, who was involved in this uh, regeneration, the coming one. And in this book, uh, Messiah and the Second Coming, it uh, gave a, 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 a description of what this coming one would be like. The coming one will not be Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist. He is for all humanity to unite all religions, philosophies, and nations. So you're thinking, well, how can that be? How can how can there be one individual who could unite all the world's religions? Now, that would be kind of difficult because you know each religion apparently seems to be different. So how is it possible that one individual could unite every one of the world's religions? Well, this is um, this is how. How many of you remember uh, something called Vatican II? It was back in the 1960s. And the Catholic Church, I think it was Pope John the Twenty-Third, uh, convened uh, what was called Vatican II, and it was supposed to kind of be a reformation of of what the Catholic Church uh, was doing. That was when uh, the Mass stopped being said in Latin and started to be said in the vernacular of wherever the you know Mass was being said, and that the priest, instead of having his back to the uh, or, or the laity would be facing the laity. Well, this man here, Karl Rahner, is kind of cut off there. Karl Rahner was uh, known as the brains behind Vatican II. And he said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic, or he will not exist at all. And back when he said that, the, uh, uh, mysticism of Christianity was very uncommon. I mean, extremely uncommon. So he was predicting that the Christian of the future will be a mystic, or they will not even be any kind of a Christian. This is from a book called The Big Book of Christian Mysticism by Carl McCollman. Uh, subtitle, Essential Guide to Contemplative Spirituality. He said, in the future, all Christians will be mystics. We need to let go of the idea that some Christians are mystics, while some are not. In essence, anybody who is connected with Christianity will be a mystic. So, in that book uh, that we just saw, he defines what is meant by contemplative. Now, that, that word kind of put me off for 10 years because I thought it just meant to think while you're praying, you know, to contemplate. But then I found out that it has, again, has the opposite meaning. And Carl McCullman says, the term contemplative comes from the Latin contemplare, which means in the temple. It has the connotation of a professional mystic connecting with a deity in that deity's temple. So it goes back to pagan Rome, and there would be these, you might call them soothsayers, they were called augurs, and they would go into the various temples of various gods and goddesses, and they would mystically commune with the deity in that temple, and that was called contemplare, in the temple. So now it has the connotation of someone who is mystically communing with God. You know, I mean, in a real uh, profound sense. In other words, you're actually hearing words and you're actually uh, feeling a presence. You know, it's, it's, that's what mysticism is, like a direct encounter with the supernatural. So the word contemplative has nothing to do with this pondering or thinking deeply. And this is how it's accomplished. Now, you may recognize that uh, there's kind of like a parallel here. Rodney Romney was the uh, pastor 
of the First Baptist Church in Seattle, Washington. I don't know if you remember, it was a, quite an imposing building. It was up on a hill, and you know, you were driving around Seattle, you could see it very prominently. But he was the pastor of uh, the First Baptist Church. And he was a practitioner of contemplative prayer. And he wrote, we cannot reach God through our minds. We can only reach God in absolute stillness when the mind has been transcended. God is only attained through that consciousness described as unknowing. Now, unknowing would be the same as what we saw earlier in uh, mindfulness and yoga and uh, uh, you know these kind of practices where the mind is switched off. And in contemplative prayer, it is known as unknowing. Okay, this is uh, from a New Age book called As Above, So Below. And, you know, they're very open about this. There's no hiding it. it, it this is not just my opinion. I'm not twisting anything. Ronald S. Miller said, those who have practiced, you were talking about transcendental meditation earlier, yogic flying, that's transcendental meditation. Those who have practiced transcendental meditation may be surprised to learn that Christianity has its own time-honored form of mantra meditation. Reliance on a mantra centering device that has a, had a long history in the mystical canon of Christianity. So that's what contemplative prayer is. It's mantra meditation. Okay, this is uh, uh, from a very popular book, The Signature of Jesus. You know, this is promoting contemplative prayer. Okay, the goal of contemplative prayer, the first step in faith is to stop thinking about God at the time of prayer. Now, did you get that? The first step in faith is to stop thinking about God at the time of prayer. Well, usually when I present this, people start chuckling. You know, they think, well, that sounds crazy, but that's what we're talking about. You know, you can't think about God. You have to switch off your mind to, to really get God. And again, choose a single sacred word or phrase without moving your lips. Repeat the sacred word inwardly, slowly, and often. And he says that if you're doing that, you will have the signature of Jesus on your prayer life. Now this individual uh, author, I've met him and talked to him, very popular news. How many have heard of a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel? Oh, yeah, The Ragamuffin Gospel. This was the gentleman that wrote The Ragamuffin Gospel. How many of you have heard of The Emerging Church? Okay, quite a few. Well, this individual is very popular uh, in The Emerging Church. And he wrote a book called The Sacred Way. And this is, this is uh, probably most of you have some knowledge of this. This is being seen as the latest, even as yoga and reiki and mindful meditation is seen as the latest cutting edge, avant-garde way of um, uh, solving your problems. This is seen as the, excuse me, the, um, the latest way of, of getting the presence of God. And he writes in The Sacred Way. The basic method promoted in the cloud, that's a, uh, a treatise from the 1300s called The Cloud of Unknowing. See, a lot of this goes back to the medieval mystics, which you'll see pretty soon, is to move beyond thinking to a place of utter stillness with the Lord. The believer must first achieve a state of silence and contemplation, and then God works in the believer's heart. So first you have to go into this mystical trance state, and then God will start to work in your heart. It's like a, you can't do it uh, if you're thinking. That's why uh, Brennan Manning said the first step in faith is to stop thinking about God. If you think about God, you won't be able to get him. Okay, this is a book called uh, Sacred Pathways. Now this author has written, for those of you that frequent Christian bookstores, he wrote a book called Sacred Marriage and Sacred Parenting. Any of you heard of any of those? Okay, well, anyhow, he, uh, he resides in the Seattle area, too. <laughs> and uh, he says, It is particularly difficult to describe this type of prayer in writing, as is best taught in person. In general, however, centering prayer, that's another term for this, is centering prayer, works like this. Choose a word, Jesus or Father, for example, as a focus for contemplative prayer. Repeat the word silently in your mind for a set amount of time, say 20 minutes. 
until your heart seems to be repeating the word by itself, just as naturally and involuntarily as breathing. Well, if you say any word for even like half a minute, it loses its uh, meaning and it becomes just a sound. I mean, you, if you try saying uh, father, you know, for uh, 20 minutes after the first 30 seconds or so, it just becomes, you know, a meaningless word or a meaningless sound. But this is the essence of contemplative prayer. And it comes from a group called the Desert Fathers. This is from a book called Finding God by uh, Anglican Ken Cache. He says it was a time of great experimentation with spiritual methods. Many different kinds of disciplines were tried. Many different methods of prayer were created and explored by them. Created. So this isn't something that comes from the Bible. This isn't something where you can turn to uh, a place you know, in Scripture and see that it was a practice. Now, a lot of times they will use, uh, what is that, Psalm, uh, uh, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. Yeah, they will use uh, uh, that to verse in Psalm that says, Be still and know that I am God. But that's talking about trusting God. That's not talking about using a mantra or going into a trance. Uh, Israel is faced with enemies and things are looking, you know, kind of dicey. And, you know, be still, go to calm down and know that I am God. But they use that to mean we have to uh, empty our minds. So this, this type of prayer was created by the Desert Fathers. Okay, again, the 4th century Desert Fathers understood that a simple device was needed to keep the monkey mind from wandering. Thus the mantra method of prayer which had been introduced centuries before by Buddhists and Hindus, came to be a stable form of Christian prayer, not only for the desert fathers and mothers, but for Christians down through the ages. And of course, until now, this would have been in you know, convents and monasteries. But again, it, uh, it was introduced by Buddhists and Hindus and was incorporated by these, these monks and that's, you know, that's why t this afternoon we're looking at, this is the Christian equivalent of what we saw this morning. And it comes from the same source. Okay, the progression of Christian mysticism. Okay, uh, probably started on, as far as, like I said, it was always practiced in monasteries and convents. But as far as actually re the idea of this reaching a mass audience was, uh, first in the 1950s, when this book, The Power of Positive Thinking, came out, written, from, uh, written by Norman Vincent Peale. And he said, throw your mind into neutral. When you have attained a quiescent state, then begin to listen for the deeper sounds of harmony and beauty of God that are be found in the essence of silence. So this was the first book that started preparing people for the idea of reaching God in the silence. And his teachings were picked up by a man known as Dr. Robert Schuller of uh, the Crystal Cathedral fame. And he uh, became extremely popular and wrote numerous books and had a, a, a school for pastors in which tens of thousands of pastors passed through and he trained them in various methods. One of them was contemplative prayer. He says, find yourself coming alive in the garden of prayer called meditation. Yes, the New Agers have grabbed hold of meditation. Hey, Christian, hear me. Let's not give up the glorious God-given gift of meditation by turning it over to those outside our faith. Well, the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, it's meditation that makes the New Agers. So do you see the, the total reversal of logic here? It's like, you know, yeah, the New Agers have meditation, but, you know, you know, we should take it back from, you know, capture it for God, because, you know, this is, uh, this is a uh, glorious God-given gift. Well, if this is a glorious God-given gift, how come you can't find it in the Bible? Can anybody answer that? And when he's talking about mysticism, he means it. Okay, this is his book, Discover Your Possibilities. He says... In a matter of seconds, I can get myself in such a state of relaxation 
uh, where I am not at all conscious of my body weight, but sense that I am floating suspended in space. And this is when I go into two-way prayer. And by two-way prayer, he means, you know, he's hearing from a source. He's uh, encountered a presence. You know, two-way prayer means that basically that would be another word for channeling. Um, the popular media have picked up on this trend and have actually uh, commented about it. This was uh, Newsweek magazine in the U.S. 22 years ago. And uh, there was an article on finding God, how, how people are finding God. And it shows this, uh, this, this picture here. This is at the Shalane Institute for Spiritual Formation in Washington, D.C. And here we have a bunch of people uh, sitting around a candle. And this is what it says down there, underlined in red. Silence, appropriate body posture, and above all, above all, emptying the mind to repetition of prayer have been the practices of mystics in all the great world religions. And they form the basis of which most modern spiritual directors guide those who want to draw closer to God. Notice it doesn't say some or many, it says most. In other words, 22 years ago, this was the most common form of uh, quote-unquote prayer that was being taught by people that are spiritual directors. Okay, Tilden Edwards was, uh, I should point this out. Okay, Tilden Edwards is the guy in the gray suit to the extreme right of the picture. This is the man that you're going to uh, hear the quote from. He was the founder of the Shalane Institute. And he says, we need to humbly accept the learnings, uh, that's his word, that's not a typo, <laughs> of particular Eastern religion, religions. What makes a pra particular practice Christian is not its source, but its intent. Selective attention to Eastern spiritual practices can be of great assistance to a fully embodied Christian life. So in other words, if you really want to be a good Christian, you need to incorporate Eastern spiritual practices, and that will give you a fully embodied Christian life. And there are 10,000 people in an organization that teaches this called Spiritual Directors International. SDI, Spiritual Directors International. And this is their, uh, their logo. Now, uh, you see what's going on there? We got this giant ball of energy, and then there's this woman who's standing there, and she's got her arms out, and she's, at, in essence, saying, take me, you know. In other words, uh, I'm yours, take me. And I guess that ball of energy represents God, and uh, the woman represents, you know, the typical Christian. Well, this organization has 10,000, nearly 10,000 members around the world. So there are 10, 000, a spiritual director is someone who teaches contemplative prayer. So there are nearly 10,000 people that are teaching this all over the world. So, you know, that's a really large number of people, and, you know, this would build up yearly. This is their magazine, Presence Magazine. Because uh, when you do this, you get the presence. But what does the presence tell you? Okay, this is uh, their courses and classes. Spiritual practice in various faith traditions, building a bridge to Buddhism. Ignatian exercises, the Enneagram and Kabbalah, the Sacred Labyrinth, the New Spiritual Paradigm, Earth Prayer, celebrating the interconnection of all living beings. And above all, trans-faith spirituality. That means that all religions are basically the same. That uh, these, this spirituality, as Alice Bailey said, would uh, encompass all the world's religions. 10,000 people promoting this. Including Ruth Haley Barton. She belongs to Spiritual Directors International. And she is one of uh, the country's leading spiritual directors. Now, uh, when we get to, after a few slides here, she is particularly, uh, has an important role in all this. 
Notice that she was the spiritual, the, the former associate director of spiritual formation at Willow Creek Community Church. Now, probably a lot of you have heard of Willow Creek, right? Yeah. You know, in uh, uh, Illinois, they're outside of Chicago. She says, a few years ago, I began to recognize an inner chaos in my soul. And this is very common. A lot of, uh, a lot of people who are attracted to contemplative prayer are people who uh, are undergoing some kind of a spiritual crisis or having uh, you know, problems in their life. Okay, I sought out a spiritual director, someone well-versed in the ways of the soul. The spiritual director said to me, what you need is stillness and silence or contemplative prayer. Our reliance on words, even in our praying, is often just another way we strive to maintain control. We can open ourselves to what God wants to give. Prayer without words is not so much about expressing our dependence on God, but rather experiencing it. And prayer without words means mantra-type prayers. And this is what she promotes next. This is her way of getting God. Okay. Ask for a simple prayer to express your willingness to meet God in the silence. A simple statement such as, here I am. Help yourself return to your original intent by repeating the prayer that you have chosen. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Now if somebody called you up on your mobile, you know, you, and you answered it and they kept saying, here I am, over and over again. Now wouldn't you hang up on them? After a while, like, you, hello, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am. You know? <laughs> I mean, how long would it be before you hung up on them? That, that would not be talking to you, would it? That would not be talking to you. That would be what's called vain repetition, but this is her way of, you know, <clears throat> of going into an altered state and, and, and finding the presence of God. Well, let me show you uh, just how influential Ruth Haley Barton is. This is uh, from Jody Dietrich. She's the chairperson for the Network for Women in Ministry of the Assemblies of God. This is one of the top women in the Assemblies of God. <clears throat> and Ruth Haley Barton has impacted that denomination to a very large degree. And it's apparent here. Countless Assembly of God people and credential leaders have testified to drawing closer to the Lord as a result of Ruth's books and teachings, which are, by the way, primarily contemplative prayer. It's really no wonder that the enemy would like to keep this message from being heard. He would prefer that Christian leaders remain too busy to stop their activity, wait on God, and hear from Him. So in other words, this was put out by the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God. This is a denomination that has 65 million people. 65 million. 3 million in the U.S. and 62 million, primarily in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So here's the top leadership is learning how to walk deeply with the Lord by using <coughs> her methods. And uh, people such as myself, people that are in the discernment field, you know, raise the alarm. And then they say, uh, well, the enemy uh, would like to keep this message from being heard. So do you see uh, the logic here that, that uh, God is using Ruth Haley Barton to uh, um, you know, help leaders in these big denominations uh, hear from God, and then when you say, no, this isn't right, then you know, the people that are critical are of the enemy. Well, let me tell you something. You can check this out. Ruth Haley Barton was trained at that center by Tilden Edwards, the same person that said that if you, uh, we need to accept the learnings of particular Eastern religions and that these uh, uh, selective attention to Eastern spiritual practices can be of a great assistance to a fully embodied Christian life. She was trained by him and his endorsement are, are on is on her, her books. So in other words, 
when you're when you're getting uh, spiritual direction from Ruth Haley Barton, in essence, it came from Tilden Edwards there, the guy on the right, you know, in the dark suit. But yet, when you point this out to people, they kind of act like, well, that's guilt by association. Guilt by association. Well, in essence, it's not. It's pretty convicting from my perspective. This is Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was uh, the man that brought this out of the monasteries and convents and spread it around to the Christian laity. He was probably one of the most influential uh, persons to, uh, in the contemplative prayer movement to make it popular and make it widespread. And this is where it led him. He wrote, It is a glorious destiny to be a member of the human race. Now I realize what we all are. If only they, you know, humanity, people, could, see them, could all see themselves as they really are, I suppose the big problem would be that we would fall down and worship each other. At the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and by illusions, a point of pure truth. This little point is the pure glory of God in us. It is in everybody. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is pure Hinduism and pure Buddhism. What you've just seen here. That inside every person is the pure glory of God, untouched by sin. But yet, Thomas Merton, what we have just seen here is a total rejection of evangelical Christianity. Yet Thomas Merton is the major icon in this movement. This uh, this, this is quite incredible. This uh, was put out by, in America Magazine, which is a Jesuit uh, magazine. This uh, Michael Leach, the guy that wrote this, was the past president of the Catholic Book Publishers Association in the U.S. Keep in mind the president of uh, the book, Catholic Book Publishers Association, not just somebody connected with it. And he did an article called New Thought Catholicism. It was back in 92, again 22 years ago. And he wrote, many people believe that the spiritual principles underlying the New Age movement will soon be reincorporated into the mainstream of Catholic belief. In fact, it's happening in the United States right now. This sheds new light on the spiritual truths about who we really are. So he was saying 22 years ago that, that New Age spirituality was being incorporated into the Catholic Church, in the mainstream of the Catholic Church. And this is basically because of people like Thomas Merton. He was giving the go-ahead. Uh, the Sufis are the mystics of Islam. And at a retreat for contemplative women in 1968, he declared, I'm deeply impregnated with Sufism, or Muslim mysticism. Okay, this is a book called Setting the Gospel Free by Anglican Brian C. Taylor. And he laid it out very clearly. He said, these contemplatives... Christian contemplatives also recognize their soulmates in other traditions, as did Thomas Merton in his pilgrimage to Buddhist Asia. This is because they have passed beyond the confines of religion as a closed system to an open awareness of God in life. So in other words, if you have this religion that's closed, in other words, it's just you're like, you know, my religion is true, it's my religion, then you, uh, you're, you're, you've kind of crippled yourself. You have to pass beyond the confines of religion as being closed. You have to embrace a universal type of religion. He said the God he, Thomas Merton, knew in prayer was not was the same experience that Buddhists describe in their enlightenment. So in essence, contemplative prayer is exactly the same thing as mindfulness meditation, only it has a Christian connotation. You know the old saying, one picture is worth a thousand words? This is Vancouver School of Theology in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, this is where they train Anglican and the United Church of Canada pastors. They have a whole room dedicated to Thomas Merton. And there's uh, in that room, there's a picture of uh, Thomas Merton, a, por a portrait, I think. And as you see, just below it, is a statue of Buddha. And that says it all. But see, Merton didn't... Uh, he didn't leave the Catholic Church and become a Buddhist. He stayed within the Catholic Church and he absorbed Buddhist theology. 
Richard Foster, he's probably one of the most uh, respected uh, writers in evangelical Christianity. He, uh, he has been responsible for making this extremely accepted within the evangelical church. Most of the people that read him and like him are evangelicals. He wrote a book called, how many of you heard of the book Celebration of Discipline? Okay, yeah, he, was the, he was the one that, uh, I think that sold over two million copies. And Foster states, contemplative prayer creates a spiritual space which allows Christ to construct an inner sanctuary of the heart. It is a portable sanctuary that is brought into all we are and do. And this has incredible appeal to many people within the evangelical church. He writes, we should all without shame enroll in the school of contemplative prayer. Now, I, I think that's kind of an a unusual sentence because well, why should we have shame, you know? I mean, what, what shame would there be in practicing contemplative prayer? You know, it, it implies that, uh, you know, you're kind of reticent, that you're kind of like, you know, this sounds kind of dodgy, you know. No, no, we should without shame enroll in the school of contemplative prayer. You know, so he's trying to uh, say, you know, this may be kind of off beat a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's, it's okay. So I, I've, met Tom, uh, I've met Richard Foster, almost said Thomas Merton. <laughs> and, and Thomas Merton died in 1968. He was electrocuted. He, he was in Thailand, and, and uh, he was taking a bath, and the uh, fan fell in the bathtub and electrocuted him. So I wouldn't want to meet Thomas Merton. You know? <laughs> but uh, I had met Richard Foster, and I talked to him about these things. And, and his last words to me were, Thomas Merton tried to awaken God's people. So, you know, that showed me that Richard Foster was very much uh, attuned to Thomas Merton's view of uh, Christianity. Uh, another one that's extremely popular is Henry Nowen. How many of you heard of Henry Nowen? Okay. He would be, uh, he was actually a disciple of Merton, and he would be, like I said, only second to Merton in popularity and influence. A lot of evangelicals uh, speak highly of him. And he wrote a book on contemplative prayer, he called it Desert Spirituality. And he said, the quiet repetition of a single word can help us to descend with the mind into the heart. This way of simple prayer opens us to God's active presence. So, I know I'm being redundant here, but you're starting to get the picture that, when you, according to this, when you switch off your mind, you get God's presence, right? You get the presence of God. Well, do you get the presence of God? You know, that's the big question. Well, he got, the, he got a presence, but this is what the presence led him to believe. In his last book, Sabbatical Journey, yeah, it's not good to speak after you eat. <laughs> either get really sleepy or you get, you know, you start to get after effects. Today I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all human beings can walk through that door whether they know about Jesus or not. Today I see it as my call to help every person claim his or her own way to God. Well, why? I mean, why, why did he say that? You know, he's got the presence of God, but he believes that, you know, he, his call is to help everybody claim their own way. Well, why? Because the God who dwells in our inner sanctuary is also the God who dwells in the inner sanctuary of each human being. Again, we have this God in everybody. You know, God is your true self. God is in everything and everybody. And this is coming from the leaders of the Christian mystical movement, you know, the contemplative prayer movement. And I, you know, you can probably see now why I'm against this. Because there's no difference between this and the secular new age. In fact, that uh, what uh, Michael Leach said, Michael Leach said, is that this is it, that this is what the New Age movement is preaching and promoting. <coughs> Excuse me. Now this woman is the poster child for uh, um, what I'm talking about. I know a lot of you are sleepy, but pay close attention to this. This is really important. It's a Sumon kid. Uh, she. Uh, she was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher in a small town in South Carolina. Now, you don't get any more conservative than that. 
you know, South Carolina is what's called the Bible Belt. So she was a typical Christian wife and mother. You know, she was married, had kids. She was just typical. She was normal. She was average. And somebody handed her a book by Thomas Merton in her Sunday school class. Now, uh, in case you don't know how popular she'd become, she wrote the two books on the right there, especially The Secret Life of Bees, uh, was very popular, and they made a movie out of it. How many of you have heard of The Secret Life of Bees? Oh, quite a few of you. So anyhow, uh, yeah, she's uh, quite well known in certain circles for those two books. But she's also well known in contemplative prayer circles. We're going to see the transition uh, and how it happened. Uh, this is her book, God's Joyful Surprise, Finding Yourself Loved. And this is, again, just like Ruth Haley Barton was having a spiritual crisis, she was uh, also kind of having a crisis, and she uh, uh, got into contemplative prayer to remedy that. She says, I found a host of Christian thinkers and saints talking about a way of being with God, a way of needing Him and experiencing Him in the depths of one's being that opened the door to oneness with Him. They called it contemplation. So in other words, this is oneness with God. I was amazed to realize that I had known practically nothing about this ancient and powerful tradition of Christian meditation. I was ready. Well, this book was endorsed by all the major, uh, especially women's, Christian women's uh, magazines. Uh, Virtue Magazine was one of the top Christian women's magazines in the U.S., it was a Virtue Magazine best book of the year, and it said, A joy to read from beginning to end. Today's Christian woman said, The message and challenge of the book is profound. Moody Monthly said, Kids suggest some disciplines for cultivating some interior quietness and a richer personal experience of God's love. This was Moody Monthly, you know, Moody Bible Institute. It's very important to realize that all the mainstream publications were endorsing this richer personal experience of God's love. Well, in the early 90s, this is her third book, she came out with The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. And this is where contemplative prayer led her. So she was in, uh, again, this is from my book, but this is quoting from her book. Um, she was in the Baptist church there, just... Uh, listening to the pastor there, and this is what she wrote. The minister was preaching. He was holding up a Bible. Okay, he was holding up a Bible. It was open, perched atop his raised hand, as if a blackbird had landed there. He was saying that the Bible was the sole and ultimate authority of the Christian's life. The sole and ultimate authority. I remember a feeling rising up from a place about two inches below my navel. It was a passionate, determined feeling, and it spread out from the core of me like a current, so that my skin vibrated with it. If feelings could be translated into English, this feeling would have roughly been the word no. It was the purest inner knowing I had experienced, and it was shouting in me, no, no, no. The ultimate authority in my life is not the Bible. It is not confined between the covers of a book. It is not something written by men and frozen in time. It is not from a source outside myself. My ultimate authority is the divine voice in my own soul, period. So what, what did that divine voice tell her? Okay. We can also, this is again from... Uh, Dance of the Distant Daughter. We also need goddess consciousness to reveal Earth's holiness. Matter becomes inspirited. It breathes divinity. Earth becomes alive and sacred. Goddess offers us the holiness of everything. As I grounded myself in feminine spiritual experience that fall, I was initiated into my body in a deeper way. I came to know myself as an embodiment of goddess. Well, this was basically Wicca, ladies and gentlemen. This is Wicca. And she got this perception by doing Christian contemplative prayer. She said, mystical awakening in all the great religious traditions 
including Christianity, involves arriving at an experience of unity or non-dualism. In Zen, it's known as samadhi. The day of my awakening was the day I saw and knew I saw all things in God and God in all things. And this is the uh, this is the uh, the common theme one finds in contemplative uh, works. Merton, Nowen, they all echo this. Along with Thomas Merton, Richard Foster uses Sue Monkid as an example of someone who practices contemplative prayer in his book Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home, in the chapter on contemplative prayer. So Foster uses her as an example of someone who does contemplative prayer. Okay, what is the verdict on Christian mysticism and contemplative prayer? What is the verdict? <clears throat> If they were really so close to God, they would understand and embrace the gospel to a degree that would be perfectly clear. But in reality, contemplative prayer has taken them in the opposite direction. Instead of being valiant stewards of the Great Commission, it has caused them to be immersed in spiritual adultery. Okay, again, Brian, these are three examples here. Brian McLaren. Uh, again, he is considered to be the de facto leader of the emerging church. This is a book called Reimagining Christianity, and you can see the dashboard there. There's a cross hanging from the rearview mirror, and that gold thing there is a statue of Buddha. And in it, Alan Jones is the, uh, the dean of Grace Cathedral. Uh, kind of an ironic twist there. Uh, says that uh, the life of contemplative prayer, loved and in communion with all things, the soul is born in and out of the secret silence of God. This silence at the heart of mysticism is not only the meeting point of the great traditions, that means world religions, but also where all hearts might meet. So in other words, he's saying that contemplative prayer is the meeting point of all the, you know, as Alice Bailey pointed out, of all the world's religions, and also, even if you're not religious, where everybody on the planet can connect, where all hearts might meet. And the head of the emerging church says, it used to be, now did you get that? It used to be, it used to be that Christian institutions and systems of dogma sustain the spiritual life of Christians. Now that Christian institutions would be like the churches, you know, and systems of dogma means doctrine. So he's saying it used to be that doctrine sustained the spiritual life of the Christian. Increasingly, Spirituality itself is what sustains everything else. I know it's kind of awkward, but he's saying by spirituality, he's saying mysticism. Alan Jones is a pioneering and reimagining a Christian faith that emerges from authentic spirituality. His work stimulates and encourages me deeply. Authentic spirituality, that's mysticism. And, and Brian McLaren speaks for millions and millions of people in the Western world. You know, not just the U.S. or Canada, but also the entire, uh, the entire, uh, you know, Europe, Australia, places like that. And when I was in England, and to a certain degree here, uh, in this section that in, in this bookstore that uh, was supposed to be Christian, it was basically uh, two types: either the uh, Christian, either the emerging church Christian, or the word faith Christian. They had uh, what was the name? Uh, Rob Bell. Mm -hmm. Rob Bell. And then they had, uh, oh, what's her name? Oh, I'm not just my blank. Uh, uh, I can't think of it, but she's a woman and she teaches. Uh, Joyce, Meyer. Joyce Meyer, yeah, Joyce Meyer, yeah, Joyce Meyer. So that represented Christianity. Rob Bell and Joyce Meyer. Again, the mystic heart. See, the, the people like us would be seen, if you're, if you're against this, you're seen as, you're, you know, really. Uh, Negative. Your uh, Alice Bailey called people like us laggards. We hold back the hour of liberation because you know this is a book called The Mystic Heart, and uh, the preface was by Dr. Beatrice Bruteau, and she says nothing is more practical for realizing our desire for a better world than mysticism. In other words, mysticism will unite the world. You know, we'll have peace, and you know, we won't have all this bombings and, and terrorism and fighting and killing because. We'll all connect with our inner divinity and we'll all join. We'll all be, you know, the world will be as one. Wayne Teasdale says, third millennial, that's now, third millennial spirituality will also be interspiritual and intermystical. 
Intermysticism is the realization that there is one universal tradition of the mystical life with many branches. So this is what Alice Bailey talked about, that there'll be one mystical perception and there'll be all these different branches, but they'll all be tied in to the idea that God is within everybody. You know, uh, Thomas Merton, we all knew who we really were. We fall down and worship each other. Uh, Sue Mun Kid, you know, Goddess uh, offers us the holiness of everything. Henry Now, you know, the God in our inner sanctuary is the God that's in every human being. The list is endless. It goes on and on and on. This is not something that I'm just making up. This is the essence of contemplative prayer. Swami Vivekananda wrote, the Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian, but each must assimilate the spirit of, of the others. But here's where, here's where it breaks down. It's a one-way street. The problem is that the Christians absorb the spirit of the Hindus and the Buddhists, but those in the Eastern religions do not absorb the Holy Spirit of God. It is a one-way street in favor of the Eastern mystics. So it's not that they become like us, it's like we become like them, and they stay who they are. Now, did you all understand that? That's very important. This is M. Scott Peck. Uh, have you heard of this book, The Road Less Traveled? Have you heard of that? Okay, that sold 8 million copies in the U.S. in the 1980s and 90s. He was excused a psychiatrist. Extremely popular with Again, you know, the uh, intelligent, Christian intelligentsia, you know, psychologists, therapists, you know, people that were highly educated. And he wrote, he was a promoter of contemplative prayer. He said that uh, contemplative prayer is a lifestyle dedicated to maximum awareness. Well, what, what, you know, maximum, that means the ultimate. So what did that maximum awareness tell him? Here's, here's what maximum awareness entails. I spent 20 years in Zen Buddhism, which prepared me for Christianity. Zen Buddhism should be taught in every fifth grade class in America. Christianity's greatest sin is to think that other religions are not saved. That's Christianity's greatest sin. Well, well the reason we think they're not saved is because they don't have a savior. You know, I mean... Um, Buddha did not die for anyone's sins. You know, Lao Tzu did not die for anyone's sins. Krishna did not die for anyone's sins. Uh, you understand? You know? But he says Christianity's greatest sin is to think that other religions are not saved. Now, here's the finale. This, everybody get ready here. This is the finale. This is the, uh, the ultimate here. Dr. Marcus Borg, notice the name of his book, is The Heart of Christianity, extremely popular, again, with the mainline denominations, you know, the mainstream denominations. Uh, he was a professor, uh, actually, at the state that I live in, Oregon, he was a professor of religion at Oregon State University. But his books were very, very widely read by, I, I've actually seen him in person. Uh, he spoke at the Anglican, uh, well, Episcopal uh, Church, you know, in the town I live in, and uh, extremely um, uh, widely uh, regarded, in, or highly regarded in uh, mainline Protestant denominations. And again, he proves that contemplative prayer is basically the same as Hindu and Buddhist meditation. He says, contemplation typically involves the silent repetition of a mantra whether a single word, a short phrase, or a series of short phrases. And he claimed in this uh, talk that he did, that I saw him at, he claimed he did this every morning. Marcus Borg did this every single morning. And this is where it led him. Now this is the finale right here. This is the, this is the, the pinnacle of, of what uh, we're dealing with. Again, this is from his book, The Heart of Christianity. It says that Jesus is the only Son of God, born of a virgin, that he died for our sins, that he rose physically from the dead, that he will come again, and so forth. This image of Jesus no longer works for millions of people, both within and outside the church. So in other words, basic Christianity no longer works for millions of people. No longer works. 
For these millions, its literalism and exclusivity are not only unpersuasive, but a barrier to being Christian. In other words, believing the basics of Christianity is now a barrier to being Christian. Well, what it's a barrier to is being an Aquarian Christian. You know, it's, it's, it's the essence to being a true Christian, but it's a barrier to being a, uh, you know, a mystical Christian. Remember what Paul Rahner said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic, or he will not exist at all. So, my point is that those, you know, that Jesus is the only Son of God, born of a virgin, that he died for our sins, that he rose physically from the dead, that he will come again, are now anathema. Those are now, if you believe that, that's what's going to get you into trouble. That's what's going to uh, cause you to be separate from what's this, this new vital world religion that's coming into the forefront. Contemplative prayer is an esoteric tradition. It was never something found in the Bible. It was never something that you could uh, uh, point to as being authentic. It was an esoteric tradition within you know, the uh, monastic orders. Matthew, Matthew 6, 7, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. In other words, when you pray, you don't say, Here I am, here I am, over and over again, you know, for 20 minutes as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. By the way, you can see here that Jesus was not interspiritual. You know, he did not have, uh, to him, the heathen were not uh, uh, soulmates, or co-mystics, in other words, he was not uh, tied into them, he was not connected with the heathen. Prayer is a personal relationship with God. It's a personal relationship. You. You speak to God out of your heart. You know, it's, uh, I suppose, you know, there's throat prayers, and, uh, like now I lay me down to sleep, you know, things like that. But generally, you know, uh, I would say that if you're a true Christian, you, you pray a lot. You know, you're sincere, and you're very heartfelt. It's, it's like talking to, you know, uh, a parent. It's, uh, it's very respectful. And as far as getting the presence of God, as far as, see the, the main thing that these people tell, tell you is that, uh, I remember Foster, I actually saw Foster, I, I told you, I saw him in person, and he said that, uh, he made this statement that, uh, you know, we're barren, we become barren within, you know, that we're floundering, that we're trying rather than training. Like he presented this picture like we're lost little children walking around in the woods, you know, not knowing where we're going. And he says, we need training, we need training rather than trying, we need a method. To, uh, to get God's attention, and of course that was it. But, you know, just being born again, you know, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10, you know, we're his workmanship. There's no esoteric tradition, you know. There's no hidden um, method anywhere where you get the, uh, you know, the a direct route to God personally. Just being, having the Holy Spirit in Paul said, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So anything that we needed, anything that was beneficial to us, we would have found in the scriptures. Nothing was held back. 1 Timothy 4.1 <clears throat> Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, Sue Monk Kidd, you know, she departed from the faith, and she gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, doctrines of devils is that, you know, God is in the earth, uh, God has offers us the holiness of everything. And notice it says seducing spirits. It doesn't say spirits. Uh, a seducing spirit is something that's kind of subtle. I mean, you don't really know what's going on. You know, you think that you're uh, getting something and you then find out later that it's not what you thought you were getting. There's kind of a, um, there's trickery going on. There's a kind of a treacherous situation that's going on. You know, seducing. And this is probably the, the main one. Now, this would cover even what I talked about earlier. You know, yoga, and mindfulness, and things like that. This, 
2 Thessalonians 2, 3. And this is really the context I'd like to leave you with. Uh, is that Bible prophecy is coming to fulfillment. That one of these days, I don't know when, I can't predict, but there's going to be what the Reiki spirit called the coming together time. And I believe that uh, that's when, with this uh, uh, chapter here, the individual that Paul calls the man of sin is going to come to power. He's going to show himself to be God. And this is how he's going to do it. What you've seen here today is his uh, um, infrastructure. There has to be something that kind of makes it real to the world's population, that makes it believable. He's going to show himself to be God. And I think he's going to do that within the context of what uh, Thomas Merton said. We all knew who we really were. You know, we, had, we all have the pure glory of God within us. Okay, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that's the tribulation, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Falling away first, the word in the Greek there is apostasia. And Paul says, and then, and then the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So I know it's pretty bad now. I know that there's occultism springing up everywhere. And I don't know how bad it's going to get before this happens, but I believe that there's a... Um, uh, decision to be made now. People need to be reached with this information that they can, you know, make a decision which side they're going to be on. Because, as we saw earlier, when uh, uh, Arthur Ford was passing out of this world, he realized that he had made the wrong choice. And I think it's our duty to warn people that uh, there is something wrong with these things, and it can be, it's not just a matter of opinion, that it can be proven, you know, when you see what happened to Su Mun Kid, and, you know, the uh, Spiritual Directors International, trans-faith spirituality, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God will lead you to fulfill what's called the Great Commission. You know, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Trans-faith spirituality is reject a rejection of that. It's, you know, you join, instead of converting uh, uh, people of other religions, giving them the gospel, you actually join with them. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul joining with, uh, you know, the members of uh, uh, the religion Mithraism or Isis or any of these pagan religions that were around back then? Remember in Acts, there was, uh, <coughs> uh, there was these... Um, idol, idol makers, and they had lost their profession because so many people, it was Diana, that's right, Diana, uh, people were being saved and turning away from Diana, and these people that made idols of her were losing their, you know, their livelihood, and they were mad. See, can you imagine Paul uh, embracing the worship of Diana? It, it just wouldn't happen. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. So that's what we're dealing with here. And then Acts 16, the slave girl that followed Paul and Silas around, that would be, as we saw earlier, you know, things like Reiki and, uh, and yoga, you know, uh, saying these men are from the Most High God and they show unto us the way of salvation. Well, even with endorsement, Paul was grieved and cast the spirit out of her. You know, the, the spirit wasn't saying, these men are liars, don't listen to them. You know, they're going to lead you astray. The spirit was actually trying to... Uh, align itself with Paul and Silas. But, you know, Paul knew what it was up to and cast it out. So even when, when there seems to be an apparent uh, promotion, there, there's actually a subtle uh, deception that's going on. So in essence, there could never be interspirituality. There could never be this intermystical, interspiritual approach to the world's religions. It's, you know, the Great Commission. You know, you go into the uh, into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The issue here is salvation. The one theme that runs throughout the New Testament is salvation. That seems to, the concept of salvation seems to be foreign to those that practice contemplative prayer. As you just saw with Marcus Borg, actually the beliefs, the doctrines that lead to salvation, he calls a barrier, you know, to being a Christian. In essence, like I said, it's a barrier to being an authentic, or it's, it's a barrier to being a, uh, a 
Christian in this this new religious paradigm, you know, intermystical, interfaith. So I believe that's it. So thank you very much for attending, and may the good Lord love you.